tonight on Life on the Rock. We have John Finley, part one. I'll give a reflection and much more. Welcome to Life on the Rock. Tonight, our guest is Dr. John D. Fenley. He's come out with a new book of which he's the editor and contributor. It's called, it's about sexual identity. Tonight, we'll be talking about different aspects of that great debate in our culture today. And it's really a discussion we need to have. It's a, a current is, issue, it's a rising issue. Um, and a lot of people need guidance, maybe support, and um, really just kind of knowing how to navigate these waters. So we're now going to a reflection with Father Mark. In our Christian tradition, we say that we're made up of body and soul. They form a unified thing. We're both corporal and spiritual. We have an intellect and will. We can reason, we can love. We can be moved by the true, the good, and the beautiful. In our scriptures, it says that God formed Adam from the dust of the ground and breathed into him the breath of life, animating him with something spiritual. The soul is our greatest value, our spiritual principle. Our body is a human body because it is animated by a spiritual soul. It gives life. That soul, the spiritual, gives life to the physical. And the whole person is intended, destined to be made a temple of the Holy Spirit in the mystical body of Christ. So we say the soul is the form of the body. It makes our material bodies a living body. It forms the material into a human body. You can't separate the two. So we're not two natures united. We're not two things. We form a a single nature, a unified thing, two principles, spiritual and material. So to think that we are something other than bodily, but just our consciousness or feeling is a falsity. Because it presupposes that thinking, that consciousness presupposes the human person, which is body and soul already. So in order to have a thought, to contemplate something, our sexuality is the most fundamental attribute of our persons, of who we are. If I'm describing to you another person you don't know, one of the first things we'll say is it's a man or a woman. Fundamental, down to every cell in our body, the DNA is male or female. Our consciousness can't change that. That's a given reality in this body-soul union in which God has made us. Dr. Finley, welcome to Life on the Rock. So good to be here. Thank you. Yes. Uh, you've co-authored and edited a wonderful new book, Sexual Identity, The Harmony of Philosophy, Science, and Revelation. And uh, we're going to try to talk about some of it. It's a big, big read. I was kind of overwhelmed reading <laughs> parts of it. But um, at one point you wanted to make was to talk about the holistic approach to sexuality, which is so much in the discussion in our culture today with transgenderism and the sexual revolution. But the holistic approach, what would be some of the component elements of that? Yeah, it's a, it's a, a fascinating topic. Um, so when I, my initial interest in this whole question mm -hmm. as to what makes us man and woman uh, comes from philosophical research that I was doing. That's, that's my wheelhouse is philosophy. Mm -hmm. I'm a professor of philosophy and uh, I was looking at Thomas Aquinas's vision of the human person and specifically um, our maleness and femaleness. And one of the challenges that I ran into um, was the presence of certain chromosomal conditions that someone might um, be struggling with, right? So uh, a condition where the person's biological sex is ambiguous. And the question has been raised, well, in that kind of a case, um, how does that conform with what Genesis and the church teaches that God created us male and female, right? It might seem like there are cases where, no, some, some humans aren't necessarily male or female. Right. And, and then that question got sort of taken and ran with by more 
progressive or leftist ideologies with the transgender movement mm -hmm. to say, look, there really is just a spectrum here and male and female aren't all mm -hmm. that meaningful in themselves. Um, and so at that point I realized, well, it'd be really good to be able to look into these conditions a little bit more, but, mm -hmm. but you would need some scientific background to be able to do that. And that's where the idea started coming to me, well, maybe we could take an interdisciplinary look at what it means to be man and woman. So get someone from the biological sciences, someone, an OBGYN, mm -hmm. a psychologist, a philosopher, a theologian, mm -hmm. right? Address this question from the gamut of the different areas of right. human wisdom. Right. And that's what the book is. Yeah. Um, the, the institutions I've been affiliated with, I did my grad work at University of Dallas and mm -hmm. I teach at Thomas Aquinas College and they both put a real emphasis on this interdisciplinary approach to truth, to reality, mm -hmm. because it's comprehensive, right? Yeah. Um, and so correspondingly, our sexuality is a, a kind of comprehensive feature that we possess. And what I mean by that is that um, to be male, for example, or to be female, uh, strongly affects your physiology. That's pretty obvious. Mm -hmm. It affects your genetics, right? The XX or XY chromosome mm -hmm. is present in every cell of one's body. It affects our behavior. Mm -hmm. And um, that's where we get into the realm of psychology. Mm -hmm. It affects our, our physiological and personal development because it's such a, a relational reality in yeah. human life. But it also um, has to do with wholly different organ systems mm -hmm. when comparing men and women. And then it, um, it affects our vocation, right, as father or mother, whether that be biological, adoptive, mm -hmm. or in a more sen a spiritual sense, or right. a sense of some kind right. of mentorship. Right. And then lastly, it has to do with the, um, the way in which we image God yeah. as a communion of persons. So that's, that's kind of what I have in mind in speaking of our sexuality as a holistic dimension of ourselves, that yeah. it, it, it affects our entire being. Right. Um, and um, part of the issue today is that it's being treated as one little bit of ourselves that could be maybe discarded or fiddled with or yeah. relegated to a purely extraneous role yeah. or um, blown out of proportion mm -hmm. in certain cases. Right? And yet you write about how it's not, it's absolutely fundamental in this basic, maybe the most basic distinction between us as human beings but it's not the most important aspect of who we are. That's absolutely right. Yeah. And that's really important to keep in mind also, especially in view of uh, the fights, the controversies that, that take place over this. And, um, and when you think of people who are perhaps struggling with either um, gender dysphoria or with a chromosomal condition that, that I alluded to earlier, it's really important to recall that while sexuality is fundamental to being human, it's not the same as being human. It's not the most important aspect of our identity. The, the truest aspect of our identity um, on the natural level is the fact that we're a thoroughgoing unity of soul and body, of, of spirit and matter, mm -hmm. right? Um, and that on the supernatural level, we're, for that reason, we're, we're made in the image and likeness of God. Right. and loved by him into existence. And so our sexuality should be seen in terms of our humanness and not the other way around. Mm -hmm. And this is something that y you might say early on in the 20th century, uh, many people got wrong with uh, Freud, for example, where humanness comes to be seen in terms of sexuality, mm. right? Sexuality becomes the fundamental feature of our yeah, being. Yeah. And everything else is interpreted in the light of that. Yeah. And uh, I think part of the genius of what uh, someone like John Paul II was doing was to um, give a certain kind of nod to the importance of human sexuality, but seeing it within that broader context yeah. of what it means to be human and fundamentally what it means to be created by God. Yeah. If you just think of our lifespan at the end of life, you know, it gets pretty simple, you know, that it passed the sexual part of our lives in one sense, you know, the sexual activity passes away. Right. And and we're left as a at the end of the day, we're a child of God made for him. Right. Destined for him to be in communion with him, to have a relationship with him. And 
Certainly, <clears throat> the sexual revolution has placed this strong emphasis, heavy emphasis on sex, and it seems to be the end all, be all uh, in today's culture. Yeah. But um, let's also talk about uh, that sometimes we have a fallen, live in a fallen world, we have a fallen human nature, our bodies can be fallen, there's a fallen aspect, right? We can have male pattern baldness, right? <laughs> we can have all things go wrong, right? Um, so certainly our chromosomes can get messed up even on that fundamental level, right? Mm -hmm. You can have XXY or something and um, how does that, does that change anything about being male or female? Yeah, so it's, uh, as you say, fallenness most visibly affects our physicality, yeah. our susceptibility to sickness and, um, and the sorts of conditions that you're talking about. Um, so I think on the one hand, again, it's important to keep in mind in light of such phenomena that that our sexuality isn't the most important thing about us. So that if you have one of these chromosomal conditions, mm -hmm. it's not as though for all important purposes that, that your life as a human is somehow shattered or yeah, fundamentally yeah, over, yeah. right? And after all, uh, our sexuality is one of these aspects of ourselves that uh, the exercise of which is optional, mm -hmm. right? And um, uh, it's not something we have to exercise the way right. in which we need to eat or breathe or right, something of this right. nature. And people throughout history have yeah. lived celibate lives, right? And this sort right. of thing. So, so that's important to keep on the one hand. On the other hand, it's important to keep in mind that um, when you have these conditions, it is true that there is a kind of loss that's present, mm -hmm. right? So um, there are extremely rare cases, but even cases where we can't really tell whether the person is male or female. Right. Um, but that doesn't constitute some third neutral or androgynous option mm -hmm. as some ideologues would have it. And the, the, the way we know that is that what's really going on there is a certain kind of defect, right? Some, yeah. Something hasn't been allowed to express itself right. properly. Right. Right. Um, f fertility, for example, isn't present. Yeah. And so um, that, if anything, that should make us re-see the male and the female as the fundamental realities. Yeah. Um, but like anything in human life, uh, these can be impacted, they can be messed up, they right. can be altered, and that can happen through genetics at a chromosomal level. But on the relational level, it could also happen through one's um, relationships and personal history yeah. and uh, abuse and manipulation. Yeah. Those things can impact the more um, interpersonal dimension of sexuality every bit as strongly as a chromosomal condition right. could affect one. Right. And uh, it stands to reason that in the cases of many of the transgender cases, you know, people struggling with gender dysphoria, that's the realm that, that we've got to be attentive to is the, the psychological realm, the interpersonal right. Uh, life. Right. Well, we're going to take a short break. We'll be back in just a moment with Dr. John Finley. So, Dr. Finley, I think the point you're making that we're male or female, and there can be, due to the fall, there can be kind of called aberrations or problems in that, but it's not this continuum of spectrum. There might be lacking some attribute of the masculine and the feminine, but that's still the fundamental data point, right? Male and female of humanity. Yeah. So. And our culture is, seems like it's, it's egging this on. <clears throat> There's a lot of lies being told. And uh, the fundamental teaching of the church about humanity is that we're, we have a soul and body unity. Talk about that. Yeah. It's come up for eons in the church. Yes. In the very beginning even, yeah. And it's a really important issue. Um, so as you say, the fundamental teaching and the language of the catechism is pretty strong on this. Yeah is that it's a, it's a thoroughgoing, substantial unity mm -hmm. of soul and body, soul mm -hmm. and matter. 
um, there can be a tendency, even among, perhaps especially among Christians, to think of soul and body as overly separate just because of the various teachings and the, the accompanying language that we tend to use. So, for example, the soul is spiritual, the body's not. The soul will go on after death, mm -hmm. the body doesn't. The soul is in purgatory, mm -hmm. right? So, that, that's conducive to viewing soul and body as these separate things. Right. Um, but in fact, what the church teaches following the tradition that begins in some way with Aristotle and gets mm -hmm. marvelously developed by Thomas Aquinas, um, the reality is that our soul is the principle that makes our, our materiality to be what it is in the first place. And mm -hmm. so you simply wouldn't have a human body mm -hmm. without a human soul. Um, and the body is nothing other than the, the very expression of what the soul is and what it, you might say, uh, seeks to be about. And the and, language used is the form of the body. Does that go all the way back to Aristotle? Or? It does. It, is? Wow. it does. The soul is the form, meaning, mm -hmm. meaning the principle of the body's very actuality. Yeah. Um, and so, so that, that's far removed from a notion of soul as something that comes to the body and makes it do stuff, right. makes it be alive, right? That's a ghost in the machine. Yes, right? exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So, but the reason that's that. Uh, view of the human person is so important to hold on to, especially now, is that some of the lies that are present in our culture piggyback off this notion of soul or spirit or consciousness as simply distinct from biological materiality. And um, one of the reasons, or something that plays into that view, is um, the astounding development of technologies that are present today that never have been in human history we're able to have a kind of control over our materiality in ways that would have been unthinkable even in, up to 70 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, there are other philosophical reasons and cultural reasons for why this view has become so prominent too, but it's really important for the sake of this conversation to see that our sexuality can't be understood without seeing the soul and body unity. Right? So on the one hand, it's clear that sexuality has a lot to do with the body. We can see the, the different organs and we can see the genetic pattern and so on. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, um, we see the importance of uh, the role that the soul plays in one's sexuality too, because the soul is the principle of the body's um, organization and its activity. Mm -hmm. right? Without soul, you don't have life. Right. And uh, without soul, you don't have the living faculties and processes that characterize us, uh, whether it be male or female. So that's another aspect of the holistic dimension of sexuality is that um, it's a matter of soul and materiality together making the person who is fundamentally the male or the female. So it would be uh, really wrong-headed finally to think of fundamentally just one's matter as male, right. or even to think of one's soul as male. It's, yeah. it's the whole person that's male or female. Yeah, yeah we tend to, today, it seems like, think of the soul as just consciousness or thinking or feelings. So if we feel, think a certain way, then that must, we don't, have to, we could ignore the body, right? Right. So the body has a reality there that we, um, that's what we are, who we are. And we can't change that by our thinking or even our feeling. So I, was, I always and, feel like too, like as Christians and helping maybe youth that are struggling with gender dysphoria, you know, we should be, obviously many are, but it seems like the emphasis should be on trying to conform that thinking and feeling to their body because that's who they are, right? Yeah, so it's hugely important what you're saying. Um, uh, T two, two notes on that. The first, briefly, uh, we're only able to feel and express ourselves because we have a body in the first place, mm -hmm. right? Now it's also due to our, our soul and our mind, right? But um, to, to be able to even say something like, well, I feel that I'm in the wrong body yeah. is a kind of incoherent statement because right. we're only able to feel because of the kinds of bodily mm -hmm. features and structures that make mm -hmm. us up. Um, but 
what you're saying is right, that um, to, to help people see that their bodiliness is who and what they are um, is, is, is really important um, yeah. these days. And um, I suppose that one way to, to help people to see that is by alluding to what we've already been talking about in terms of the soul body unity as, as a crucial aspect of our, yeah. of our being. Um, but also, once again, uh, we've become so, in the first world in particular, we've become so subject to a barrage of idealized uh, images of the human being yeah, through right. media and right. often hypersexualized ones right. Right. Um, that give people a lot of concern and anxiety over their perceived shortcomings. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, I heard some good, this is kind of a life hack, but it was like how to foster body acceptance is to maybe look at the functions, what your body can do, you know, instead of like looking at just the images of comparing myself to a Hollywood celebrity or something. But just that we can run, move, play, you know, do things, you know, and, and express ourselves with arts and things like that, that we can appreciate um, what the body can do, the great gift and nobility that it has. That's a great point. Yeah. And of course, the only way you do that is by actually engaging in those activities. Yeah. And it helps you uh, achieve a kind of healthy self-forgetfulness. Right. Right. But, but, but at the same time, a self-appreciation, which yeah. is the point you're making. Yeah, yeah. And I think along with that, um, the importance of friendship in human life, mm -hmm. real friendship, um, not just what Aristotle early on referred yeah. to as a friendship of enjoyment or pleasure, yeah. but a friendship based on uh, things that are truly important about oneself and where there's a fundamental um, acceptance from the other person and a desire for one's good on the part of the other person. Because yeah. There you have a human relationship that is, again, it's body and soul, yeah. but it's not necessarily sexual. Right. right. Um, and 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 there's a an, an acceptance of one's wholeness as a person, yeah. body and soul together in friendship. That's um, that's very natural. Right. Well, uh, we're going to do a second show with you, but uh, we got a lot more to talk about out of your book, Sexual Identity. So thank you, Dr. Finley, for joining us. So good to be here. Thanks. Okay. Well, that's a lot of information. That's a deep discussion. You know, we barely touched the surface, of course. Yeah. But you know, one of the things that I come back to is, I think he makes the point so beautifully in the book, is that that's a, a fundamental a distinction in our humanity is male and mm -hmm. female. And yeah. you can't change that. No, I mean, it's written right there in the very beginning of yeah. the Bible yeah. that we are created in God's image and likeness. And I think really at the deeper, maybe root of this is that, you know, as man has turned away from God in so many aspects of our lives, we, we're now questioning who we are sexually. Right. Our whole identity yeah. is gone. And I think there, again, knowing who God is, knowing our role in creation, that we are made in God's image, you know, and just to know just those fundamental truths that we're, you know, adopted sons of God, we're co-heirs with Christ, we're the temple yeah. of the Holy Spirit. These are important truths yeah. as Christians that right. we have to embrace and live out. But having that, that just connect, that relationship with God, because whenever we sever that, you know, all the truths in this world are literally turned upside down. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, like the fact that we're made male and female in the image and likeness of God, that we stand before each other as different, but yet we equally image God, and we image different aspects, qualities of God right. in the preeminent way for each gender. And there's such a complementary role mm -hmm. because, you know, men need women and yeah. women need men. Right. You know, we're not, yeah. it's not actually this battle that you hear, right. just the battle of the sexes, but no, it's actually more about working together, you know, yeah. and what we can achieve, understanding their gifts and talents and having women understand the gifts and talents of men yeah. and working in a harmony, a group, a family. Yeah. So. 
And people are always fascinated when we talk about gender differences, you might do psychological studies. It's like we crave to understand ourselves better. We're fascinated with those differences. Mm -hmm. And the differences of the others, it always seems almost inexhaustible. <laughs> like the more you get to know people, uh -huh. I find the deeper the mystery is. Yeah. And we can say that about our masculinity and, and femininity as well. Like God has gifted each with certain gifts that are build up the other, that are complementary, right. as you say. And uh, you can actually bring forth life right. and serve life. So. I just even think when you're a little kid, you know, if you get hurt, you know, dad's usually not the first person you go to. It's usually your mom. Mm -hmm. That's very instinctual, yeah. you know. And yeah. I think because the mothers, you know, they nurture. They have that ability, not to say that a father can't, but there's almost just a human, a deeper humanness there. Yeah, a naturalness that they have. So. We need both witnesses in the world today. Both have a role to play, to serve in this culture, to serve in transforming the world, ordering it to God, to Christ. And that may we all be a part of that in a way that flourishes for each of us individually. And may our Heavenly Father shine His face upon you. May He give you His peace. May He fill you with His Holy Spirit and give you every good gift and grace. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We'll see you next week on Life from the Rock. A master plan. No matter the guilt that I'm feeling, in the end I will see it was worth it. Our lives are in your plan. I can feel you move just hearing your heart. Baby, this is mommy, and I just want you to know that you are saving me, cause I choose life, and I choose Purify.